earnings per share tells a prospective buyer or an owner of a common share of stock how much earning power they buy when they buy one share. The formula is pretty simple. Earnings belonging to the common shareholders divided by the weighted average common shares outstanding. So this company had net income of $1,750,000 last year. We subtract out the money that belongs to the preferred stockholders. We know that there's $2,500,000 of preferred outstanding. We know the annual dividend is 10%. So that's $250,000 that doesn't belong to the common shareholders. A million seven hundred fifty thousand minus what belongs to the preferred shareholders means there's a million five hundred thousand dollars that belongs to the common shareholders. It tells us the weighted average number of shares outstanding is five hundred thousand. A million five hundred thousand divided by five hundred thousand means our basic earnings per share are three dollars. The hard part is diluted earnings per share, or how low can it go? So if all the dilutive securities were exercised in the worst possible combination. How low could that $3 per share go? And what we're going to do is we're basically going to do uh, three steps. We're going to calculate the hypothetical effects if all these guys, the preferred bondholders and the preferred stockholders and the people that have these options all converted or exercised. Then we're going to rank them from bad news to good. Then we're going to do the calculations cumulatively until we get to good news. And that's when we stop. Okay? So let's start with the, uh, with the options here. This company had 50,000 shares that could be purchased for $20 per share. The average market price was $30 per share, but nobody exercised their options. So let's calculate the hypothetical effects of those options. What would that do to the numerator? If they bought these shares, it wouldn't change net income one way or another. We use the treasury method to figure out what would happen to the denominator. In other words, we pretend like we take all the money they would give us. In other words, 5,000, 50,000 shares times $20 a share means they would give us that much money. We would pretend like we went out and bought shares back in the market place for 30 bucks a share and subtract that from the 50,000 shares that we just issued to tell us how many new shares would exist. And in this case, if they exercised their options and we took that money and bought back shares, there would only be 16,667 new shares outstanding. So what does that look like? What's the hypothetical effect? Zero. Zero dollars added to the numerator, 16,667 shares added to the denominator. Okay, next, let's take a look at the 8% convertible bonds. These 8% convertible bonds are converted into each $1,000 bond is converted into 40 shares of common stock. Well, if they converted the bonds, we wouldn't have to pay interest on them. So if you look at the formula in this cell, we take 8%, these are 8% convertible bonds, times the face amount of the bonds, and then multiply it times 1 minus the tax rate, because remember, interest is tax deductible. This company's in the 40% tax bracket, so for every dollar of interest expense we incur, we reduce our income tax bill by 40 cents. So the incremental effect, the incremental hypothetical effect is we add $120,000 to the numerator. And what happens in the denominator? Well, there's $2,500,000 worth of bonds outstanding. We divide that by 1,000 to get the number of bonds that are outstanding. Multiply that times 40 because each $1,000 bond can be converted into 40 shares of common stock and we find out that we have $120,000 in the numerator, $100,000 in the denominator. So that's a buck 20 worth of news. A buck 20 is better than a zero. So we rank that second. Now let's take a look at the 10% convertible bonds. Same analysis there. If we, if they had converted, we wouldn't have had to pay them interest expense. 
So the face value of $2,500,000 times 10% gives us a year's worth of interest. Multiply it times one minus the tax rate because for every dollar of interest expense we pay, we get to reduce our income tax bill by 40 cents and you end up with a million fifty, excuse me, $150,000 in the numerator. Similar analysis for the eight as to the 8% bonds. There's $2,500,000 worth of bonds outstanding. We divide it by 1,000 to get the number of bonds. Each bond is convertible into 40 shares. So what would have been added to the denominator is 100,000 shares. So we do that division, and that's a buck 50. Still bad news, but better news than the buck 20. All right, and then the preferred stock. Well, if they converted the preferred stock, we never would have paid them that $250,000 worth of preferred dividend. We never would have owed them that money. So we get to add that back to the denominator. And it tells us that the 10% convertible preferred stock is issued into, can be converted into four shares of common stock. So in other words, since the par value is 100, that means there must be 25,000 of those shares outstanding. Each of them can be converted into four shares of common stock. So we end up with uh, $250,000 added to the numerator and 100,000 shares added to the denominator. So that is $2.50. So this is ranked from bad news to better news. All right, so now let's do step three over here. Do the calculations cumulatively until, until we get some good news. All right, so what are we going to do? What We start with this million five here. There's nothing to add because of the options, but in the denominator, we're going to take the 500,000 shares and add the 16,667, which would be the extra shares that would be outstanding if we took the proceeds from when they exercised the options went right back out and bought back shares. So our earnings per share now after this is the million five divided by the five one six 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 seven worth of shares. And now we've gone down from three dollars down to two ninety. Now let's do the same thing for the convertible bonds, but build off of what we had before. So what we're going to do with these convertible bonds is we're going to take that million five fifty from above. We're going to add the interest expense for the 8% bonds because if they had converted, we wouldn't have had to pay that interest expense. We're going to tax affect it. One times one minus the tax rate. And so now we end up with a numerator of a million six hundred and twenty. In the denominator, we're going to take that 516,667 shares, add the 100,000 if these guys had converted, and now we're up to 616, 667. So what's happening to earnings per share now? Now it's down to 263. Let's do the 10% convertible bonds. Same thing, cumulatively. So we're going to take this million 620. We're going to add back the interest expense after tax on 10% bonds because if they converted those, we wouldn't have owed them that much interest. But we have to take into account the fact that interest is tax deductible. So we end up with a million 770 in the numerator. So remember that's the numerator from the last calculation, adding back the interest expense on the 10% bonds after tax. And then what's happened to the denominator? We had 616, 667. We add the 100,000. Now we're up to 716, 767. You do that arithmetic, and earnings per share is down to 247. So we're still getting bad news, and that's good. All right, so let's do the last one. Let's do 10% convertible preferred. All right, so we'll start here with this million seven seven hundred seventy thousand, and we're going to add this two hundred fifty thousand dollars because if these guys had converted their preferred stock to common stock, we wouldn't have owed them the preferred dividend. So there's no need to subtract it in the first place. So we're going to add it back. So million seven seventy. Plus this 250,000 gives us 2 million and 20,000. And what happens to the shares in the denominator? The 716,667 plus the 100,000 that would have been added because these guys converted, and you end up with 816,667. We do that arithmetic, 
and we have plateaued. We're still at 247. So if we had ranked anything below this, we'd stop doing the calculation there because we do the calculations cumulatively until we get good news. And this is good news. We're stuck at 247. After that, uh, we don't do any more calculations. So basic earnings per share, earnings belong to common shareholders, divided by the weighted average common shares outstanding. Diluted shares, how low can it go? What's the worst possible combination of events how bad could the news be? Calculate the hypothetical effects of each of the convertible or dilutive instruments. Rank them from bad news to good news. Do the calculations cumulatively until we get some good news. And that's how you do diluted earnings per share. Hope that helps.